Anyang uh, Haseo. Uh, hello, my name is Jim Laramore. I'm the Chief Officer for Equity and Learning at Red Labs, and it is my distinct pleasure today to help facilitate a panel with three, uh, no pressure on them, brilliant, uh, wonderful kind of educators who care about equity and ethics and the way that AI uh, is being used and will come to be used in education. And in just a moment, I'll turn to them to ask um, each of them to offer a brief um, comment or two or some self-introduction so that you'll get to know uh, them. But I do want to uh, just position our conversation today uh, by way of saying that um, artificial intelligence or AI, as we commonly refer to it, is something that I think is talked about fairly frequently now, but not necessarily understood in the same ways by everybody. And it is a technology tool, among other things, and thus it has the potential to do um, great good on one end of the spectrum or potentially great bad on the other. And, uh, and as a tool, you know, it will um, do things that we allow um, it to do. It can be shaped and formed and used in ways that, you know, that humans have a great deal of responsibility to craft uh, carefully. And we're looking forward to a, a conversation today about how uh, some leading thinkers in the field are thinking about the use of AI and issues of equity and bias um, in education as well. Uh, so if I can, uh, Cassandra, I'd like to turn to you maybe for the first introduction and then to uh, Joy and, uh, and Saad. Great, thank you so much, Jim. I'm Dr. Cassandra Herring. I'm the president and CEO of the Branch Alliance for Educator Diversity, Branch Ed for short. Um, we are a national nonprofit organization that works with in-service teachers and principals, but most importantly, works with colleges and universities that are tasked with preparing teachers for, uh, for our nation's schools. Um, in working in teacher prep, of course, AI is a very important part of how we might be thinking about the teacher workforce of the future. It's nice to be here. Great, thank you, Cassandra. And Ajoy? Everybody, I'm excited to be here, and I'm especially excited that this is called High Tech, High Touch. I think both are very important. Um, my own background, um, I started off as a teacher uh, and community organizer working with kids and families, particularly in low-income communities uh, in California. Um, before I did a, a quick pivot to the world of business, uh, I was a buyer for schools of technologies, food, photocopiers, and a whole bunch of things to keep schools running. Um, and then advised as a management consultant, I advised um, Fortune 500 companies in technology and in healthcare before spending the last four years uh, working in philanthropy, um, funding learning R&D. Um, and that's a fancy way of saying I was putting together teams of teachers, technologists, and researchers to work with families and communities around the country, primarily in the US, um, on problems of education and innovation. Um, and so that's kind of what brings me to my work today where I continue to advise several philanthropies as well as work with um, researchers and other institutions who are pushing the boundaries of what we know and understand about learning and then how we apply that in real classrooms and in the real world. Thanks, Ajay. And um, Saad, can we turn to you? Absolutely, thank you, Jim. Uh, hi, I'm Saad Khan. Uh, I'm the Chief Research and Innovation Officer at Fine Tune. It's an edtech startup that builds uh, AI human hybrid solutions for next-gen uh, learning and assessment systems. I'm a computer scientist by training. I have a PhD in AI and uh, have worked in the tech R&D sector for about 13 years. Uh, I gotta say my trajectory into edtech uh, wasn't linear, uh, but uh, education um, has always been uh, very close to my heart, you know, just growing up in, in, a, in a very different country in Pakistan. Uh, my parents really hammered into me the value of education was really their uh, investments and, and uh, hard work uh, that I was able to get to a point where I could come to this country in America to pursue higher education and then a career over here. Uh, first, mostly working in tech R&D, um, a lot of programs funded by uh, the Department of Defense, or organizations like DARPA building training systems for warfighters to be able to actually uh, do the job well, particularly uh, building on soft uh, training skills. And I really felt that there was an application of the tech that I was building in that sector in education, particularly to help learners, uh, helping teachers and students to be able to actually 
uh, improve learning outcomes. And so I pivoted into EdTech and uh, have uh, have had a, a, a you know blast. And uh, currently, I think uh, what we're doing a fine tune building AI human hybrid solution for things like creating new education content and uh, remediating skill gaps with uh, highly targeted uh, learning resources um, can be a way to mitigate some of the equity gaps that we see in education, even in, in America. Terrific, well, thanks, Sam. So uh, I think uh, you can probably all see kind of in, or hear in the introductions already kind of points of connection and um, um, potentially some similarities and uh, points of view uh, that have been formed over the time that you've been working in education or uh, in um, education technology. Um, education is one of those areas where uh, there are many diverse stakeholders and where almost everyone feels a sense of um, ownership or responsibility for certain things, or at least expects that their uh, voice, their opinion will be heard. And uh, Cassandra, I'd love to start with you in this uh, conversation. Uh, because we can think about um, ownership of AI uh, in terms of um, who is actually creating the technology, or we can think about it in terms of you know, ownership or who ultimately is going to be using it or who's accountable uh, for how AI is used. And so I'm wondering if you could maybe share your thoughts about um, how you think about access to and ownership of artificial, intelli and artificial intelligence, both in terms of um, knowledge and about um, the AI technologies? Absolutely. Um, I think AI for, for all on this panel has a real um, powerful opportunity to be a great equalizer in terms of um, affording uh, individualized instruction, um, empowering teachers to better meet the needs of their students, um, bringing together uh, programmers and educators to create new content that can bring about these, uh, these goals. I think one of the risks though, is that AI can become another part of the digital divide. I think we've seen in the United States and certainly across the, uh, across the world that the pandemic amplified uh, some of the negative aspects of the digital divide. Those who have access to computers, to internet, to other technologies uh, being very much separate from those who did not have access and the incredible impacts on educational opportunity that, span, that, that developed from that. So I think as long as we are moving intentionally, bringing multiple individuals to the table around the development and design of AI to bring about more equitable outcomes, and then even thinking about access uh, to AI technologies, uh, being uh, having broad base and diverse teams that are developing those technologies, then we're able to really make sure that it is that equalizer, that accelerator of education and not, again, the new digital divide. Jim, can I build on that really quickly? Oh, please. I think as I heard Cassandra talk, um, what I heard there was also about the importance of relationships. Absolutely. Um, between technologists and educators. And I think funders have a big role to play in this because I think sometimes we equate with new things that are coming, um, kind of coming to market or coming to the field, we equate fast with being good. And so fast doesn't always allow for relationships to get created and then for the right stuff to get built or the most helpful thing to get built. Um, and I think funders are really kind of have a big role to play in that because ultimately money kind of determines speed. Um, so whether I think you're a venture capitalist or a philanthropist or working in government, I think sometimes um, funders feel the pressure to move things along pretty quickly. Um, and I think that ends up kind of really steering, uh, steering the direction of what things get created because sometimes we jump to what can get created fast as opposed to what can get created well. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd love Saad's thoughts on this. I'm sure he's got some. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, speaking of uh, pressure from founders and, and funders and what have you to be able to get products to market quickly, right? That's the name of the game. You're absolutely right. Um, in doing so, it's so important, particularly in education, to be transparent about ultimately what the larger vision and goals are and how those issues of equity and 
I think to Cassandra's point, uh, uh, not doing harm, uh, unintentional harm, as you bring these new uh, technologies and products to market. I think it's, it's, it's absolutely critical. I think progress is being made. And the reason the project risk is being made is because attention is being paid to these issues. And people are raising their voices and their concerns on those issues, rightly so. Because once that, part, that is part of the larger equation to be optimized, then progress could be made. But for a long time, these were just not issues that were even considered, right? Issues of um, bias in data or equity, or, or is this tool going to just enrich, you know, <laughs> the fund is a, or the mutual happy ultimately versus uh, the benefit it would bring to uh, to learners. So I'm glad that uh, you know those issues are being surfaced and uh, they're getting the attention that they deserve. And uh, Joy, uh, I'll turn the tables on you a little bit and come you're asking a question your way. Um, is you've had the uh, benefit of being both a classroom teacher or someone who's worked um, in schools and at the district level and then working both in innovation and in philanthropy. And I'm wondering if you could maybe share your um, insights about um, how we can, um, uh, or if you think about all of the stakeholders as representing participants within a single ecosystem, right? Uh, what is it that we need funders to understand about the uh, value of input and, um, and ongoing participation or involvement of educators? Um, and as an as a educator, what is it that you think your fellow educators need to uh, um, know or perhaps embrace as a mindset for you know, speaking um, or engaging in different ways uh, with people who do very different things than they do, right? In terms of technologists and people who are creating new products. Um, first, I think just quickly about funders. I think um, funders uh, recognizing that, and this is increasingly happening, so it's, it's good, I think, as Todd pointed out, we're kind of moving toward a more evolved state in our ecosystem. Uh, funders recognizing that educators need to be partners as opposed to subjects is very important. Yep. Um, so that they're kind of co-designers of new approaches, new technologies, what have you. Um, and I think for educators, I think uh, probably three things. I like to have three things. Um, the first is kind of what we're already seeing about keeping us honest, right? Like educators are the closest people to students, often the closest to families as well. And so educators can really keep the rest of the field honest about what's working and what's not. Um, and also I think educators can, can kind of, in some ways like sometimes force technologists and researchers to explain things in lay people's terms. Uh, uh, because I think that translation, when we can explain something that's complicated, whether it's AI or a particular branch of research, in terms that regular people can understand, we actually advance our knowledge. And so that translation, I think, is very important. And few kind of stakeholders other than educators can actually help that translation to happen. Um, I'd say the other two things I'd love uh, to encourage educators to do is, uh, you know, learn about cutting edge stuff. Don't, don't be intimidated, right? Um, just because it's got fancy language or lots of research papers behind it, it doesn't mean that it's beyond you. Um, and so learning, I think learning, like learning about new technologies, there are, you know, there are uh, specific, I'd say, subcategories of National Science Foundation funds or DARPA funds or um, governmental funds that are meant for uh, kind of the promoting the education of particular emerging technologies. And so, you know, that, it's like that money and those funds are meant for you, right? Uh, to kind of be at the forefront of, of some of these new areas. And then the last thing I'd say is to, to experiment, right? So uh, when educators, um, I had some of the most fun in my classroom when um, I was working on something that was new and cutting edge that I didn't fully understand. And my students could see me struggling with it. Um, there's something very important about modeling what it meant to learn and modeling what it meant to struggle and not have the answers. That was very powerful for my students to understand that that learning doesn't stop when you're 25 or 30 or, or 45 or 60. Um, and so I think modeling that for students can make um, something like AI more of a citizen science, right? 
where uh, educators and students can kind of be working together on things um, that are really at the cutting edge of the field with uh, alongside amazing technologists or scientists. Um, and so having kind of seen some of that really, I, I think I've really seen in the last four years, the best scientists and the best technologists are very open to that because they realize that learning and information can come from anybody. On that note, Ajoy, I really appreciated your sort of situating educators as partners and not just sort of the subjects of this technology. And I wonder if you would entertain maybe a fourth role that educators could play as instigators. Um, oftentimes these technologies are arising from technologists and not from educators saying, hey, we have this pressure point. Can technology help us solve for that? Or we have this set of routine tasks that if we could take that off our plate with, tech, with a technology solution, then that would free us up to do so many other things. I think what I don't often hear are educating, educators really naming and asking for technology tools that really can enhance what they do. Would you entertain that as a fourth? <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. I think when we start with the problem, as opposed to starting with a solution, then we really have magic to do, right? Um, because when we're then we're able to have an honest conversation about here's the problem, here's what the tech can do, here's what it can't do, and so here, let's build something together. I love that. I love that, Ken, Cassandra. Yeah. yeah. And so, as a yeah, as a technologist, how how would well, you? Well, I can say from experience that what Cassandra and uh, Joy are saying are exactly right. <laughs> That's true. In fact, I think the best edtech solutions ha ha are written by educator needs. Actually, our company was founded by a, a teacher uh, themselves. And so uh, I firmly believe uh, that uh, it's not about uh, building a solution that you can then give it to the consumers, which is the educators, but really co-designing and co-developing with them because it's a very complementary nature of the skill set. Uh, as a technologist, um, I would rather invest my energy and resources in addressing a pain point that I cannot, uh, that, ought, that is there, right? Uh, to enjoy, uh, your point that, you know, you gotta start with the problem rather than an actual, you know, solution to it. And that many times comes through an interactive dialogue with, with educators themselves. And so um, in a lot of the, the product design that we do, we actually work with subject matter experts that tend to be sometimes teachers or students and uh, try and figure out, you know, how we can actually come up, uh, build a solution that a bit more is customized to those, uh, to their needs. So just wanted to underscore and uh, maybe just agree wholeheartedly with both uh, of you guys. Perfect. Well, we, uh, Asad, if we could stay with you for a minute then, because what you're describing and I think what the conversation has led to at this point is an approach to um, the use of artificial intelligence or tools and systems that uh, can be powered by um, AI that are really uh, kind of either supplemental or augmentative uh, to the yeah. learning process rather than being a substitution for um, teachers or human contact or other things. I'm wondering if you could maybe expand on um, that topic and um, maybe just also offer your opinion about whether you feel that the field is moving in this kind of broader direction, um, or if we have a bifurcation between uh, those who might see AI as a substitute uh, for teaching versus uh, maybe an augmentation of, of teaching and learning. Yeah, um, let me start with the first over here, mm -hmm. uh, this, this notion of uh, AI being an augmentation. Uh, and uh, yes, absolutely. In my opinion, that is in fact the most rational and realistic stance to take currently mm -hmm. on what AI can actually do for us. Um, the state of the art in AI has uh, certainly made significant advances over the last decade or so, but it is far from reaching a level of um, general purpose intelligence that um, we expect and take for granted in many of our everyday experiences, least of all in a highly demanding and uh, creative endeavor like teaching that, uh, that, you know, if you've got kids uh, that you've been trying to help over the course of this pandemic, you would know uh, 
uh, without uh, having uh, the right teachers available to you, how hard that is. It requires a high degree of creativity and problem solving. So uh, AI excels uh, quite well when it comes to narrowly defined tasks, uh, but it's often tripped up by novel situations uh, that the humans can be easily handled with some good old fashioned uh, you know, common sense. Uh, but if you look at this through the lens of an AI-human partnership or an augmentation, uh, as Jim, you put it, then certainly AI can help automate some manual and tedious tasks like uh, writing test questions, for instance, or scoring student responses. But the flip side is the opportunity that such advances would actually afford for, for teachers, for example, in a classroom where they'd be able to deliver every student a customized formative assessment, feedback based on automatic and score responses, all in real time, right? Just, just imagine that. So I, I really do feel that the most impactful advances and applications of AI are really where there is an AI human hybrid nature uh, of its application. Now to your later question, your second part, has there been a bifurcation I don't think so. I mean, in my view, that is not the case. Sometimes there is an, um, a media hype and uh, concern around AI being out there to replace uh, existing workers, take jobs or what have you. I, I really don't think on the ground that is the reality. And as I was saying earlier, and all of us that have been through the pandemic, especially the ones who have got small kids, uh, we know that the state of the art in the AI is nowhere close to be uh, something that could be a substitute for something as complex and involved as, as teaching. And I don't really even see in the short to mid term any progress that could come close to that. So really the, the right uh, perspective and lens to take on this is how could you use uh, this technology as an augmentation to, to help you focus on things that really require that human touch. Great. And Sad, so your, your comments made me think that one of the uh, most humbling experiences I've had over the last 15 months has been having my uh, two high school age sons at home uh, learning remotely or learning online. And I uh, thought back to when I first joined Red Labs and was uh, starting to do a deep dive and learning about um, AI in education. And one of uh, my AI research colleagues said, you know, Jim, on, in terms of um, a uh, smart tutoring system. He said, AI is, as um, um, I'm thinking exactly how he put it, but it was basically that it is in like infinitely patient. And what I've learned about myself over the last 15 months is I am not, <laughs> right? So there are some things around personalization or being able to uh, provide feedback without judgment or without the learner feeling somehow judged or pigeonholed uh, in some way. I think that, you know, the technology um, you know, can be used in, in particular ways that could be very helpful. Or for, um, I know in, in higher education places that have used um, AI chatbots have found that students are more likely to ask a question because they don't feel like there's a person on the other end of the phone who's going to be judging them about whether that was a smart question or not, whether they should have known that already or not. Uh, and I, I do feel like we are in this kind of very interesting um, transitional space of, of starting to you know, sort some of this out now. So. Jim, I think to that point, as, 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 uh, um, as much attention and focus as we're spending around um, what AI technologies to develop, I think it's important that we also remember the human side of education and what are those human elements that we absolutely want to preserve mm -hmm. and how can we leverage the AI technology again to free teachers up to focus on those things mm -hmm. that the technology cannot do things like motivation, things right. like building relationships, um, things like connecting with families and communities uh, that the technology is not situated to do, but that we know creating a space of belonging, affirming the individual identity of students are critically important to learning uh, for all populations, but particularly um, populations that might be marginalized or disadvantaged in some way. Um, so I love this idea, um, uh, Saad, about uh, there being a human partnership uh, with AI. I think that's really powerful. Oh, that's terrific. Well, we, um, we may circle back around to this kind of a topic one or more times over the course of the conversation. But I, I'd like um, at, at this particular moment to think then about 
uh, some of the um, either barriers to the uh, use or kind of um, confidence and adoption around artificial intelligence or um, on a parallel track, the kind of guardrails that we need to make sure are in place, whether it's around uh, bias or uh, uh, concerns about student privacy or data security uh, and, and so on. And uh, Cassandra, I'm wondering if you, as a, a person who's working with um, uh, teacher leaders and those who are preparing uh, people to go into the classrooms and to lead our schools in the future, if you could maybe take the first uh, pass at that in terms of, um, uh, you know, to have uh, the confidence of educators, uh, what are some of the uh, things that people are worried about and what guardrails should we be thinking about? Sure. I mean, I think the number one guardrail here is intentionality, intentionality on behalf of designers to ensure that they are representing a diversity of experience. That may mean that the people who are designing, the teams who are designing um, should be diverse uh, of perspective, of racial, ethnic background, uh, potentially of li linguistic background as well, um, to ensure that that technology that's being developed is accessible to a broad uh, group of students. Um, I think the second thing that teachers really care about, uh, uh, at least the folks that I work with really care about is where these technologies are deployed, either on a pilot basis or on another basis, that they are truly deployed across a wide spectrum of schools and community context and the like, so that in that prototyping and piloting phase that truly the information being gathered about the student experience, about that human partnership with teachers, that it is truly representative of a broad array of context. Um, I think there's always a problem if tools are piloted in one context, uh, perhaps an affluent context where some of the um, uh, parameters around the use might be different than when it's deployed more widely in other contexts. And I don't think we always think about uh, making sure that that sort of prototype or pilot group is representative of the full breadth of the audience that we'd like for them to be deployed. Uh, I think that that is uh, hugely important. Um, and I'll stop there. I'll stop there and let my colleagues comment. Uh, Jim, what about, you know, I'm wondering, what about, um, as I heard Saad and Cassandra talking about the last question, um, it kind of brought up this interplay when we talk about partnership between humans and technology, it's kind of like really important to talk about what's the role of each, right? And what are, Cassandra talked earlier about preserving uh, the relationship, preserving some of the aspects of human contact that are very important, even as we invest in technology. It's just a very simple situation that's brought up for me was, um, you know, Students might feel comfortable, more comfortable asking a question to a chatbot um, or a search engine, if you will, than they might to a teacher, right? Um, and so what this brings up is, you know, there's a lot of power in that because, you know, sometimes the limiting factor in a classroom is a student can only maybe get raise their hand once and get their question asked once. But with the chatbot, you could you could actually pose a lot of questions, right? And so a student's knowledge can be getting updated much more quickly. At the same time, a teacher's role could be to look at what's, what is that arc of questions that a student is asking the chatbot? But then this brings up an interesting question around privacy, right? Because, you know, if a student may or may not feel comfortable asking certain questions to a chatbot versus a teacher, because those questions are private or, or considered to be private. So then what role does a teacher have to kind of audit those questions or look at those questions or a teacher and a parent? And so we kind of need to have really interesting approaches to developing policy for these things right. that have to be much more on a case by case as opposed to blanket policy. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, it just feels like policy making in an age of human and technology partnership is tricky, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd love to hear thoughts on that from my other two colleagues here. Yeah. And from you. It's, <laughs> it's a fascinating point, right? You mentioned that, uh, and, and Jim, you too, students feeling a bit more comfortable when they're talking with a chat box, uh, chat bot, what have you, because they're not feeling judged, right? Or uh, in that their privacy um, is not uh, something that, um, you know, that they have to be concerned about. But therein lies the biggest challenge yeah. uh, with these products. To be able to preserve 
privacy, for instance, and reassure not just the student, but also the parents, teachers, schools, and what have you around those issues, that we don't end up monetizing um, that kind of student data when it's captured without consent. Uh, so those are exactly the kind of policies that have to be put into place. And this is way before we even get to issues around how the data is being captured so it does not reflect biases and AI and machine learning on top of that. But I think we, at a very fundamental level, it's very important to be able to actually build that trust that is needed, uh, that students continue to feel that they can use you know, the, this kind of tech. Uh, now, the flip side is, of course, that uh, there's, there's a remarkable potential, at least, around the democratization of knowledge over here. Uh, the fact that uh, only a small fraction of the students around the world can afford to have a personalized tutor. And we know the impact of, of what a good tutor can do in Two Sigma, you know, Bloom's work and so forth, uh, around that, the impact. So to be able to actually produce something which could have even a fraction of that impact, but is globally and at scale available, is a, could be a huge boom. Right? But you have to balance that with issues around privacy, uh, data use, and so forth. Um, so with this, um, I, I do want to maybe pivot a little bit to think about um, issues of um, kind of equity and bias, and kind of which is another, I think, topic for um, uh, conversation and learning um, by teachers and other educators, and then for a cross-sector uh, conversation as well. So um, you know, for um, 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 for Sun's benefit, there, there was a um, panel discussion um, at the Association for Advancement of AI uh, conference a few months ago, and uh, Cassandra was on a panel with um, Adam Kalai from Microsoft Research. Uh, and one of the examples that Adam shared with us was that they had a cross-disciplinary team uh, within his company that was um, looking at word pairings. And when he described that was basically uh, to uh, you know, uh, teach AI to reason by analogy or to construct analogies. And, um, and the example that he pro uh, provided was um, both you know, kind of um, very interesting and very troubling at the same time, because they used um, information that um, AI could be trained on that was available. So information that's contained on the, in the internet and found you know, highly gendered, um, sexist and otherwise problematic word pairings that the AI very quickly started uh, to spit out. Uh, and you can imagine then the concerns about, you know, kind of using um, publicly available information or kind of scraping um, uh, public information off of the internet as a way of training um, AI. So, you know, it revealed um, reasons why I think, you know, uh, for their research team, good that they did this in a controlled environment. Uh, Adam explained to us that it was really essential that um, they had a multidisciplinary team looking at this because they recognized it or caught it sooner than they might have otherwise. And, um, and I think the alarm bells went off maybe a little bit louder and more quickly than might have um, been the case otherwise as well. And so I'd like to maybe get um, any insights that you might have as a practitioner who works with this uh, you know, kind of um, uh, challenge all the time, if there are other things that teachers you know, should know, if there are counterexamples of, you know, kind of how do we uh, teach ourselves to be more careful and um, anticipate potential challenges um, as we work our way forward around the use of AI. And I think fundamentally then this, it kind of comes back to a question uh, um, that I know that you've given some thought to in terms of um, whether it matters who codes or what gets coded or how people approach the task of, of coding uh, in um, AI and other technologies. Those are fascinating questions, uh, Jim, uh, and a great example you know, that you brought out uh, from Microsoft's work over there. Um, you know, sometimes I feel that, that uh, saying that bias in uh, AI application is just because of the data set. While it's true, it, you know, technically that might be the case, it doesn't end up being very satisfying because it's almost like singling out almost this last link in the yeah. whole 
causality chain uh, while ignoring the rest of the system, right? Uh, and, and the micro example is a good one, uh, but there have been a plethora of examples, for example, uh, um, you know, face recognition software that have uh, difficulty uh, in doing face recognition for, for people of color, for instance. So, so certainly, technically speaking, there is bias in the data, but uh, we have to think about the entire system in situations like, uh, like that. What went wrong? Why the data set? Why was it biased in the first place? Is the product itself in a result of biased market research? Is there an issue in the data collection and the labeling that went towards creating the trading set for a machine learning solution? Uh, if the data set is biased, uh, why did we end up using it? Was it because there isn't any process in place to screen for that kind of data bias? Uh, what biases are we watching out for? And in the event you end up uh, detecting those, you know, what processes are in place uh, to catch downstream biases in QA and so on and so forth? So, I mean, I think these are larger organizational cultural problems. And uh, many times, in fact, yes, team diversity does end up helping with those organically, but really having formal processes in place uh, it, now at least, you know, in 2021 is, uh, I think, is, is absolutely necessary. Um, you know, I, to your second part, um, how does the having, you know, does it have an impact? Who, who develops these, this system? And, you know, to the larger uh, question around diversity of teams, I certainly believe so. Uh, just as it matters what technical skills and technical training an engineer has in, in coding an algorithm, uh, like their depth of knowledge on data pre-processing, model selection, validation, uh, putting it into production and so on and so forth. Similarly, the level of awareness and understanding of issues of bias can have an impact on how well the final product addresses those issues. And uh, unfortunately, while there's a lot of attention paid towards developing those technical skills, in, uh, particularly in higher education, uh, there isn't much attention paid to the issues around addressing or being cognitive and aware of issues of bias uh, in higher ed when it comes to these uh, highly technical degrees. Moreover, the tech organizations or the industry at large is lacking um, in these regards too. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, it's it, it, certainly having more diverse teams can help organically uh, pick up and, and create the kind of guardrails that are necessary over here to mitigate this concern. But uh, this is high time to have formal processes in place to catch and, and remediate those. Tim, I wonder if we can't spend just a minute more on this um, because I think the word pairings um, example to me highlighted that algorithms represent the, the society in which they're built, right? You know, there's a saying that fish don't know that they're swimming in water because their reality is swimming in rot water. And, uh, and I think for the, the word pairing study where they pulled words from the internet, built associations from, from content that already exists, right? Narrative that already exists, that's already there it's almost as if building the algorithm off that data set is not enough without taking some intentional action um, to address what might already be there. Um, Saad, I'd love for you to talk about that. Like, how do we ensure um, that the data sets that we're using, I won't say are free of bias. I, I would almost start with an assumption that they're biased toward what the current reality is. And how do we begin to lean in on that to make sure mm -hmm. that we're not replicating and potentially magnifying that bias, but we can affirmatively act to address it? That's a, that's a great question. And it's something that is actively being researched upon from a technical perspective to come up with uh, solutions that would, um, to some degree, uh, automatically flag those issues. And one really cool idea that I came across was uh, that uh, uh, the output of an AI algorithm should be such that it does not say, when it comes in, in, in the paradigm of privacy, does not actually reveal the identity of individuals that are part of it. So, if, so that kind of a metric being applied across the board 
can have a huge impact on ensuring that from a machine learning perspective and we're optimizing for whatever fitness function. If this is an additional metric to take into account, the final optimization might actually be better when it comes to issues of revealing people's identities and you know, exposure to privacy. And the same could be done around um, predicting you know, people's ethnic or racial backgrounds, age, and so on and so forth. So I think uh, uh, it's a hard problem, right? Because if you think about it, right, uh, <clears throat> there's no oracle around this problem. Take once again the example uh, of the, the co-occurrences of, of words. Now you can take all of that data and say, okay, before we actually uh, mine this through with a machine learning pipeline, we got to have a human review on top of that. But people tend to have subconscious biases themselves, right? Because so that to your point, I mean, it's a reflection of at least some, some uh, microcosm, right? That the data was reflected. So how do you actually pre prevent that? Sometimes, you know, you have to then start going back into issues of, around policy. Um, maybe having integrated reliability and multiple people reviewing it and actually having active, uh, explicit training around those issues, right? Um, so it's a hard problem to solve. Uh, and once there is a better way to represent what would be the policy considerations, then I think there is a chance that competition models could be built around that that satisfy that criteria. Thank you. And so, Joy, I'm curious, I'm sorry, Jim, but I'm curious, Joy, what you think about the role of philanthropy and others that are funding this work to sort of keep the foot on the gas of this imperative to ensure that bias is at least intentionally addressed, if not completely solved for. I think this is a function of will. Yeah. Right? This is, uh, I think a lot often systems are developed um, for the for people who can pay, right? So when we think about just the kinds of AI systems or what have you that we prioritize, the questions that we prioritize asking, it's for customers who can pay the most money often, right? Um, or somebody who's at the top of an organization to be able to see what's happening as opposed to for an end user to be able to see what's happening. Um, and so I think um, very intentional movement in areas like philanthropy toward a more community-driven design where we actually prioritize what parents are asking for or what educators are asking for. And, and those kinds of questions, I think starts to put us on a good path. Yeah. But I, I'm with Saad on, we, we do need processes, right? Like processes with multiple le levels of review. And then we got to look at what's our policy for how we determine who the reviewer is and what kind of training we provide them. Um, and so, I think all of those different pieces of a system are really important, but I think what I've just noticed is that our starting conditions, things like the speed that we want to move at or the story that we want, uh, sometimes have a disproportionate bearing on where kind of the direction of progress is. Right. Yeah, and I would say, you know, there's a, um, a connective element, I think, in the things that you're saying as well. Um, which is um, you know, for us to think about you know, whether we have the training data available or whether we need to go find it or create it so that we end up you know, having a sense of assurance from the beginning that it's a more representative or complete um, data set or a data set that is uh, more free of bias or potential bias uh, to begin with. And I think this is where, and I think of the examples of um, um, how AI might um, search the internet for passages from literature uh, that can be used for teaching purposes or you know, to construct um, homework questions or test items. Um, you have to start with the assumption that, uh, that um, everyone has had an equal opportunity to get their work published, where we know historically you know, that hasn't been the case, still um, isn't um, the case, um, but it is an area where you know, I think that uh, there must be a Way I think you know, I love uh, Saad's suggestion of figuring out what are the processes that we need to have in place so that the right questions get asked, or that we learn to ask ourselves, you know, uh, the right set of questions along the way, so that we can actually um, turn the corner uh, on uh, you know, from where we are, recognizing what we've inherited, 
and then you know turn the corner and um, find ourselves able to move in the direction that you know that we want to go in the future. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Um, so with this, um, so if I circle back around to the question. Um, that I asked on uh, originally. I'm, I'm wondering, Joya and Cassandra, if you'd have anything more to add on the topic of um, you know, uh, what, how it matters or whether uh, it matters um, who codes and, and how we approach that work, how we think about you know, the people who are going to be um, creating the future that we're all going to live in. I think I'm going to start sounding a bit like a broken record, Jim, <laughs> but, but I think. Uh, um, I really think translators are important to this. So, you know, we've talked about partners generally, but I think um, the people who sit at the intersection are somewhat have a really important role to play. So people who sit in the intersection between technologists and educators or technologists and researchers, and you can kind of speak multiple languages, super, super important. Um, that's not everybody, right? Because I think often, uh, folks who are kind of firmly in one camp or another, it's hard for them to translate across, right? And, or they may not have time or circumstances that would have you. And so I think uh, really contributing to, to developing people who are, and I think so far what I've just observed is that people who sit in an intersection, um, often it's because of some accidents that they kind of end up there, um, non-linear career paths, uh, different kinds of things. But I think systematically developing people at the, for the intersection is very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, you can kind of function as those multilingual translators. I wonder what my colleagues think about that. Powerful, Joy, I think I learn from you every single time <laughs> we interact. No, I think that's really powerful. I think the same level though of intentionality needs to be placed around how are we cultivating the AI workforce of the future? Wh wh where, what communities are we reaching out to uh, to think about programs for young people, programs for ch career changers, programs for uh, others who might wanna get in this space? How can we be intentional about ensuring that we're building a diverse workforce there? Um, that can help to be some of the coders and designers. Absolutely. I just want to underscore that one of the fascinating things I find about teaching is that it's this meta level of you know, how learning takes place, which is almost uh, um, inherent, uh, the, you know, the big research in AI too, and to be able to actually build up algorithms that can figure out how to learn new things, right? And so, um, in education as a, as a teacher, right? You, you're always exposed to multidisciplinary work, right? You know, when I work with uh, subject matter expert or teachers, I mean, I'm actually learning from them. So it's that multidisciplinary nature of the experience that has a huge impact, I think, on, on you know, better outcomes at the end, so. I'm still trying to connect that meta level thing. Eventually, hopefully, you know, with AI, we'll come a little bit closer to how teachers know how best to help, you know, kids learn. If there was a way that we can mirror some of that in algorithms, wouldn't that be great? Yeah, I love that. I love that thought. I think, um, you know, kind of uh, space is very important, like co location can be a really big part of this, which is, I think, something that we all missed out on incredibly during the pandemic, right? So I think if, when I've seen situations where, and these unfortunately are too rare, but hopefully they become more common, where you have, you know, universities co-located with the school so that research and practice can flow more, um, more quickly from one to the other, or companies. This is what this is the, like the center of the idea of the, the innovation park, right? If we have schools that are like that, right, where um, you know experts or technologists are co-located with children and teachers and, uh, and university researchers. There's a few examples of these and they're really powerful. They're obviously um, uh, expensive to develop in you know, initial concept. And there must be ways, I think, given kind of our technology with Zoom and other things to kind of create that or simulate some of that for those who are far away. But I think that's just very promising because the more overlap you have with somebody in your day to day, the more trust that gets built up and the more natural accidents start to happen. So I feel like space is kind of an important part of this. And so I'm excited for, you know, as the world hopefully moves back toward normalcy, um, you know, how can we move 
How can we, how can we again use the benefit of physical co-location to do this? I'll just give mention one example of this that I've seen in Philly that's so powerful to me. So there's this uh, uh, out, of, out of Drexel University, there's this lab called the Excite Center um, that's kind of blending different technologies, whether it's in fashion and consumer with computers or music and technology. And they chose to locate their lab um, in, in uh, a part of Philadelphia that's not typically where people associate R&D. Um, and they chose to locate it off the street so that people from the neighborhood who are walking by can stumble upon this lab and kind of be welcomed inside um, and actually participate in some of the work for the community, with the community. And so it's kind of this amazing, I think, concept of how do you locate cutting edge work in community, right? And make it relevant um, so that you kind of increase kind of the, the benefits that come from co-location or from, and then you create accessibility and pathways to the cutting edge for people that may historically have not seen themselves at the cutting edge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. I better go check it out, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it may be very nearby. Yeah, I think it, it's uh, yeah, it's an interesting example of um, really intentionally designing for that kind of occurrence, right? We're bringing people together. And what might, um, if you didn't know uh, the thinking that had gone into it, you might view it as you know, kind of a serendipitous thing rather than something that was kind of built to um, engender just that kind of interaction. That's a great, great idea. Really. Well, I appreciate that. So I think with our um, time uh, now reaching almost a close, I, I do want to ask um, or maybe just invite you to make any uh, kind of closing uh, comments or share any uh, kind of final thoughts that you might uh, with the audience. So the group gathered in Korea, lots of educators, also a group of education technology uh, people, um, innovators and policy makers uh, who are thinking very broadly. So um, Saad, since you went last the first time, if we could start with you. Any Kind of closing thoughts that you would like to share? Uh, well, I just got to say that I am super excited about the potential of AI in, in education. I feel the field has so much uh, to offer uh, and the state of the art in education is actually, it, it's not, it, I mean, and if you compare ed tech with where big tech is or in biotech or, or even in fintech, I don't think the state of the art in AI has been operationally utilized in education nearly as well. So there's a lot of opportunity, you know, I mentioned earlier, being able to create highly uh, efficacious learning content. That's just one aspect, right? Being able to actually recommend the right content to remedial skill gaps is a whole other thing. Uh, what about creating educational experiences that are beyond your typical pencil and paper or even digital experiences? I think Cassandra, you mentioned earlier around things like uh, creativity or, or collaborative problem solving. Uh, Adri, uh, you mentioned um, the co-experience, uh, the physical presence and uh, interaction elements. How can we actually capture that in a form where you can now have a better sense around your communication skills and how to remediate those, right? So, so there's a lot of potential. And uh, the great thing is that because of technologies like Zoom, uh, code subversioning, open source content and code, uh, research papers coming with code uh, and the democratization of uh, AI that is taking place uh, in the AI community, there is a lot of uh, opportunity for people across the world really to collaborate and, and get to a joint understanding of the larger challenges that we face globally uh, on, on, around education that I think we can make a huge impact on. Great, thanks, Sad. And Ajoy, any final thoughts? Yeah, I think I'll go in a different dimension. I know that um, you know this conference is um, an initiative of the Education Commission of Asia. Um, and so I just think Asia's got a massive role to play in the age of AI. Um, you know, a lot of AI depends on big data and Asia is the biggest continent in the world. And so in terms of population. And so I think in terms of um, things that uh, the West has really had kind of a lot of investment in research. Um, but I think 
Asia has got a lot to contribute to our knowledge base in terms of research and our understanding of how people are. And so um, I think that's super exciting. I think the other thing is uh, that Asia has done really well in other fields um, is develop low cost or extremely affordable, but high quality resources. So for example, if I think about cars, Toyota Corolla came out of Japan, right? Or if I think about um, high-tech electronics, Sam and what Samsung's done in South Korea, um, we do, I could say we, because I'm Asian, um, we do affordable and high quality really well. And so I think when we, if we take that same approach toward education, thinking about affordability and high quality, I think that's going to be really important because if I think about human training in the last 20 years, a lot of the innovation in Asia coming from India uh, has been on cost, right? So a lot of outsourcing has taken place to India because of cost. But in an age of automation, you need to think about how training, how we need to compete on quality as well. And so uh, I'm excited for kind of the scalable approaches to, to that that will come out of Asia. Great, great. Thanks, Adrian. And Cassandra, you have the last word. Well, I'm very excited about this conversation, all of the possibility and um, opportunity that we've unpacked. I think one part that I would punctuate as a last thought is I haven't heard a single person say that we can replace a teacher. Um, educators are essential to this conversation as partners, as collaborators, as end users, um, dot, dot, dot. Uh, and I think as we begin to think about the educational opportunities of the future, rethinking what is the role of teacher how can we begin to um, lighten their load so that they can be deployed on those things that AI cannot do um, is very exciting. And uh, so I will leave it on that note. Um, the human partnership with AI uh, is very, very exciting. Okay, terrific. And that's a, a wonderful note to close on. I'll, I'll simply say to our um, education and innovation colleagues uh, who are gathered for the High Tech High Touch uh, Conference in Seoul, uh, we offer all of these thoughts as a kind of our gift to you and hope that you'll find some value in them. And we look forward to seeing what great things you will do for students in your country and elsewhere around the world in the future. So, Gamsamadat, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you.